I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs and the University of Iowa's honors program. They contribute vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I also thank the Stanley UI Foundation support organization for their financial support. And I thank today's special sponsors, Midwest One Bank and the Iowa City Noon Rotary Club. I also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2 and UI Libraries Digital Archives. Please be sure to, uh, to like City Channel 4 on Facebook. As I mentioned, I'm the Acting Executive Director of the Iowa United Nations Association, and I want to take this opportunity to thank ICFRC for uh, hosting today's event. Uh, today is October 25th, and it is the day after United Nations Day, October 24th, which was the 71st anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. Uh, the, Iowa City United, the Iowa United Nations Association is the Iowa affiliate of the United Nations Association of the USA. We are a nonpartisan membership organization devoted to education and advocacy about the UN. Uh, we're delighted that Ambassador Lang is in Iowa for three days. We're taking him on a tour around the state and uh, we're very grateful to him for his very generous contribution of time and expertise. I have placed some information about the Iowa UNA on your table. We would welcome your continued involvement and contact, and so I invite you to look at that information. Uh, I'm going to introduce the president of the Johnson County chapter of UNA, Gene Lloyd-Jones, in a moment, but I would like to introduce two other people in the audience. First, uh, uh, Dorothy Paul, who is the general chair of the Iowa UNA. Dorothy. And <laughs> applause. And secondly, I'd like to introduce Alexa Sandin, who is the president of the student chapter of UNA on the University of Iowa campus. Alexa is back in the corner. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the newly elected president of our UNA chapter here in Johnson County, uh, Jean Lloyd-Jones, who will introduce our speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce Ambassador John Lang. He has had a long and very distinguished career. He serves as the primary focal point for the UN Foundation Global Health Diplomacy activities. Prior to joining the UN in 2013, he spent four years with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, working with African governments to improve public health. Ambassador Lang had a 28-year career in the Foreign Service at the U.S. Department of State. He was ambassador to Botswana from 1999 to 2002. He had tours of duty in the State Department Bureau of African Affairs, and Western Hemisphere Affairs and Management in Washington and at U.S. embassies in Togo, France, and Mexico. The UN Foundation's work is currently focused on climate change, global health, peace and security, women's empowerment, poverty eradication, and energy access. 
Please join me in welcoming Ambassador John Lang. Uh, thank you very much, Jean, and thank you very much, uh, Jim, and, and, and thanks to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council and the Johnson County uh, UNA uh, for inviting me uh, here today. Uh, I worked in the national office of the UN Association of the USA uh, in the late 1970s, and I remember coming to Iowa to speak in Des Moines and meeting with Dorothy Paul, and it was a delight to see her again today. It's been uh, a long, long time. Uh, it's, um, it's also an honor for me to be here uh, as a um, Wisconsin Badger coming here into your midst. <laughs> it was only a few days ago that, uh, that uh, we played football together. Uh, <laughs> couldn't resist that one. Um, uh, I'm here today to talk about global health and sustainable development. Uh, but first, what uh, I would like to talk about is the election. Um, now, I'm sure that all of you followed uh, closely the, the polls and the public debates. Uh, it was a close and unpredictable race, but it's over. Uh, after a historically open process with an extremely robust pool of candidates, and including several strong women, the UN Security Council on October 6th voted to nominate Antonio Gutierrez to be the next UN Secretary General. <laughs> And then the General Assembly itself on the 13th of October uh, appointed him by acclamation to be the ninth UN Secretary General uh, uh, beginning uh, January 1st of 2017. Now, in case you're also following another election, um, uh, next January will be the first time since 1953 when a new U.S. President and a new UN Secretary General uh, take office uh, in the same month. Uh, back then, it was Dwight Eisenhower and Dag Hammarskjöld. Uh, so, uh, we are uh, at the UN Foundation and, and UNA USA's national office. We're looking on this as a great opportunity, actually, for the U.S. and the UN to work together for a better world. Uh, from our perspective at the uh, UN Foundation, uh, we're uh, very much looking forward to a strong and vibrant partnership with Antonio Gutierrez, the, the new. Secretary General and his leadership team. Uh, he's the former UN High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, the former Prime Minister of Portugal. He has tremendous stature on the world stage. He's shown a depth of commitment to multilateral cooperation, and he's been a tireless advocate for the rights and dignity of the most vulnerable. Uh, and we all know that the huge refugee problems the world's face uh, has been facing, and uh, he had been the leader of uh, the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees Office in Geneva until uh, the end of last year. So uh, it, it was actually our, the chairman of uh, the UN Foundation, Ted Turner, who, as you may know, founded the UN Foundation in 1998 by uh, giving a gift of $1 billion, uh, $100 million over 10 years uh, each year, uh, to the United Nations. Uh, uh, and it was Ted Turner, he's still our uh, uh, chairman and, and the founder of the UN um, <coughs> Foundation. He uh, ha co has called Antonio Guterres an impatient humanitarian who will be a tireless diplomat for the hopes of people everywhere for a better future. So uh, it seems to me that um, this is really an exciting and a consequential time uh, for the United Nations and uh, the UN Foundation and the UN Association and all of us who are involved uh, in, uh, in for, uh, international affairs and foreign relations. <clears throat> You've had uh, some momentous uh, uh, decisions made. One, of course, was the Paris Agreement on Climate Change that occurred uh, a year ago, and also the General Assembly's approval of the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals that were approved in September of last year with 169 targets. And they really showed that the world is ready to work together and through the UN to take on the many challenges that we face globally. What I'd like to do today is to focus on um, goal number three of those sustainable development goals, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Uh, there are um, health dimensions to almost all of the goals uh, in the sustainable development goals, but the one that really focuses on health and has some specific targets under it is uh, the SDG goal number three. 
But what I'd like to do even before that is to kind of um, give you a historical perspective on, on how I view how global health it, uh, efforts uh, the, it themselves have advanced over the last uh, 15 or 17 years and um, uh, how we still have much more to do. And um, with that, I'd like to bring up my own experience as the U.S. Ambassador to Botswana. Um, President Clinton appointed me or nominated me to be the U.S. Ambassador to Botswana in 1999. Uh, and uh, uh, when President Bush uh, came into power, he, uh, he kept me on there. So I was there from 2000 uh, until 2002. And uh, as you know, and we have Ambassador McMullen here in the audience, when you're a U.S. Ambassador, you uh, look at the full range of U.S. government interests. Uh, because that's your job, to advance U.S. government interests. And in Botswana, and I had had earlier tours in Africa, in West Africa, Togo, East Africa, Tanzania. In Botswana, you had so many of the things that the U.S. government was hoping uh, African governments could achieve. Long-standing democracy since its independence in 1966, a relatively free press. Uh, an orientation toward the uh, private sector because they, uh, their big resource, diamonds, uh, was operated by uh, the Debswana Diamond Mining Company that was more or less half owned by the government of Botswana and half owned by De Beers and Anglo-American, but run as a private sector enterprise. And I still remember going to visit one of the diamond mines and seeing these Caterpillar uh, uh, tractors, <laughs> Caterpillar brand name tractors. Uh, and, and, and uh, moving equipment wh where the tires were about 10, 12 feet tall. It's just amazing what they were doing in terms of the diamond mines uh, using U.S. technology. Uh, and it had a, a small military uh, under civilian control, but a very good military that the U.S. military was very pleased to cooperate with. So, so many things were going well in Botswana, and it's still looked upon as <clears throat> one of the great African success stories because uh, even with their own resource of uh, diamonds, they have, uh, uh, as advertised when you enter the country, zero tolerance for corruption. Now, I don't mean that they have no corruption, but, uh, but it uh, uh, ranks very highly on uh, surveys by uh, such organizations as Transparency International in terms of its, its honest uh, way of doing things. And when I got there in 1999, it was estimated that 38% of all adults aged 15 to 49 were HIV positive. And that was probably a high estimate based on the uh, faulty methodology at the time. It was probably closer to 33%. Either way, it's a disaster. One out of every three people y you meet uh, in a situation like that is HIV positive. And the cost of antiretroviral therapy, which is, uh, it can extend a life uh, indefinitely when you're HIV positive and prevent you from uh, coming down with AIDS and dying, was $10,000 per person per year, way out of the reach of uh, all but the richest uh, Botswana. So when I looked at the panoply of U.S. government interests, I made HIV AIDS my signature issue. And it was really uh, an incredible time uh, back in 1999, 2000, 2001, because there was such concern about this HIV AIDS emergency that was uh, uh, spreading um, uh, beyond Southern Africa. It was in India, Thailand, and many other countries. And AIDS was all over the world, but uh, it's particularly prevalent in certain countries. In January of the year 2000, the United Nations Security Council met to discuss the impact of AIDS uh, on peace and security in Africa. It was the first time ever that the UN Security Council met to discuss a health issue as a matter of international peace and security. And um, uh, I, I discovered upon arriving here that Jim Olson actually attended that session here uh, with, uh, uh, in New York, which featured uh, the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. at the time, the late Ambassador Richard Holbrook, and uh, Vice President Al Gore was at that session. <coughs> there, the U.N. Secretary General, Kofi Annan, who is now one of the members of the Board of Directors of the United Nations Foundation, um, said that the impact of AIDS in Africa was no less destructive than that of warfare itself. By overwhelming the continent's health services, by creating millions of orphans, and by decimating health workers and teachers, AIDS was causing socioeconomic crises which in turn threatened political stability. In already unstable societies, that cocktail of disasters was a sure recipe for more conflict, which in turn provided fertile ground for further infections. 
So there was a real sense of an emergency uh, uh, at hand in the global health world based on the uh, uh, expanding HIV AIDS crisis. And in the year 2000, uh, there were only about 770,000 people out of all of the millions who were HIV positive who were accessing that antiretroviral therapy. That's a bit of the perspective then at the turn of the century. <clears throat> what happened? How did the world respond? And here's where I think we all can be proud of the, the work that's been done by the United States government and by uh, international organizations in the international community. You had the UN Millennium Development Goals that uh, went from the year 2000 to 2015, and, and three of those goals were uh, related to health to reduce child mortality, to improve maternal health, and to combat HIV AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And several new institutions were created in, uh, back uh, at that period. One was Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, which ensures, uh, at first it was focused mostly on introduction of new vaccines. Now it's also focusing a lot on uh, what we call routine immunizations. Uh, the basic immunizations that anyone needs, and they um, have saved millions of lives through vaccines. You had the creation of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where I had the privilege to work for four years um, after I retired from the State Department. Uh, they were cr created in their current uh, uh, design uh, in the year 2000. Uh, as of last year, they were uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation which does work beyond global health, but, but just on global health, they were contributing $2.9 billion a year for global health programs. In the year 2002, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria began its operations uh, in Geneva. And then a program of which, where I was the first, uh, uh, one, uh, first of the two uh, deputy global AIDS coordinators uh, began uh, called PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Uh, and uh, I have to say, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was uh, on a plane uh, and happened to be across the aisle from uh, uh, Joyce Banda, who's the former president of Malawi, and uh, we uh, talked about global health issues, and she said, you know, I've never met President George W. Bush, but I can't wait to see him because I want to thank him for what he did to save lives in Africa under PEPFAR. Uh, you also had uh, the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative, and more recently, the Global Financing Facility, uh, which was created in 2014 in support of the UN Secretary General's program called Every Woman, Every Child. And that financing facility is to accelerate efforts to end preventable newborn, child, adolescent, and maternal deaths and improve the health and quality of life for women, adults, uh, adolescents, and children. So this, during this period, after the, the, the crises that I mentioned, especially HIV AIDS in the, uh, around the turn of the century, there was a big boost in the amount of money as well as the number of organizations dealing with global health. What we call development assistance for health uh, grew rapidly, <coughs> at, at actually over 11 percent per year from 2000 to 2010. Since then, it's uh, almost leveled off. It's only increasing about 1.4% uh, annually. But um, right now, the total uh, development assistance for health, uh, at least as of uh, the year 2015, was $36.5 billion. And these programs, uh, this is from all donors, governments, uh, foundations, non-governmental organizations, etc. All those programs have really had a huge and positive impact on human health. Uh, uh, for those of you who are uh, students and still trying to look at uh, what your careers are, when I say there are these big programs in global health, that also means there are jobs in global health. So if you're interested in that uh, as a career, it's, it's really a fascinating place to be working in. Now one part of this uh, that I'd like to emphasize is uh, uh, what in global health circles we call the vertical versus the horizontal. Vertical programs are those that are focused on a particular disease or condition. And that's really what uh, PEPFAR does, uh, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or what the Global Fund does, which uh, focuses on AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. The idea is to make sure that the, those who are HIV positive have uh, the antiretroviral therapy that they need, uh, promote programs to uh, uh, prevent transmission of HIV, 
uh, and to care for uh, uh, children who are, uh, who are orphaned uh, by um, uh, AIDS from uh, when, when their parents die. Uh, those kinds of programs are, are vertical. They also help benefit the broader health system, but they're really in focused very specifically on a, 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 a particular goal. And a lot, I must say, a lot of donor governments uh, like that because they want to be able to say we saved X number of lives uh, by providing this vaccine or, or, or this antiretroviral therapy or whatever the case may be. The problem is that they don't necessarily extend to, uh, to the, the entire populace and they don't really benefit the broad health system, which is the horizontal way of looking at things. And really, you need to have a strong health system if you're going to uh, uh, really uh, properly serve the populace. The, the children who are vaccinated before age five eventually become adults. The women who safely deliver children eventually become grandmothers. The, the HIV positive patients on antiretroviral therapy grow older and eventually suffer from other diseases. And they all need quality health care services. So uh, from my perspective, we're actually in a bit of a, tr a transformational period here in this global health effort. Uh, People have even questioned why PEPFAR is, still has the E in it. Why, why do we have the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief when AIDS doesn't present the same emergency that it did back in the year 2000, in part because the cost of that antiretroviral therapy went from $10,000 a year in 1999 to uh, $100 or $200 a year now, and it's much more available. Uh, the, um, uh, we're now in a situation where there's much more of a recognition that we need to have strong health systems. And I have to give a bit of a, 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 can, a, candid, a, a candid explanation here. I, d I was the co-chair of an Institute of Medicine report on investing in health systems in low and middle income countries, so I do have a certain bias here. But uh, there are kind of two ways that th we can go about this. One is keeping the vertical programs, and I don't think anybody wants to get rid of those vertical programs and just have one huge program to strengthen health systems. That really wouldn't be the way to go. But uh, to have those vertical programs emphasize more than ever how they can strengthen the health system as they operate in their uh, focused way. And that uh, some people call a diagonal approach. And in other cases, we really need to undertake a broader effort uh, that would be part of a, uh, uh, the uh, effort under the, the Sustainable Development Goal, uh, uh, goal th number three, the health goal, target on universal health coverage. And that's becoming more and more talked about in global health circles because it is one of the targets, universal health coverage. The Director General of the World Health Organization was even hoping that it would be the, the, the overriding goal at one point early in the in negotiations because it's that important. The thing about universal health coverage, and it does include um, a, an element called financial risk protection, so that when you're covered by health care uh, and, and if you have a, a, a catastrophic illness, you don't immediately become broke. By having universal health coverage, we really will be reaching the poorest of the poor. And that's one of the fundamental premises of the entire sustainable development goals, leave no one behind. Because too often in countries, you can look at the broad national statistics, but if you break it down by quintile, the bottom 20% of people in terms of income, in terms of marginalized populations, maybe they're in city slums, maybe they're in r remote rural areas, maybe they're refugee populations, too often they're the ones who are lacking in getting basic immunizations and getting basic health care. And by having this target of universal health coverage, it really forces the, the, the global health community to concentrate more of its efforts on strengthening <coughs> those health systems in, in as I said, a, a horizontal fashion, not just the vertical fashion. If you want to know um, where the wake-up call for this was uh, uh, and, and why we need strong health systems, it was Ebola. Uh, back in uh, the summer of 2014, uh, Ebola uh, was uh, starting to uh, uh, expand rapidly in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And uh, I remember having a conversation uh, uh, in, uh, in September of 2014 with someone who had been in Liberia at the time 
He said he went to a health clinic one day and it was uh, 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 very, very busy. He went back the next day and it was just teeming with people. And the third day it was just chaos with with people dying in front of you. It was just, it just the, the way this built up so quickly uh, because it was such a, a terrible, terrible disease and so infectious. Over 11,000 people died from Ebola out of over 28,000 cases. That is huge and we are so lucky that it didn't become global. There were uh, a, uh, a, n a number of cases in the United States. <coughs> uh, the way the U.S. media works, you probably thought there were as many cases in the United States as there were in West Africa because it, it got so much publicity here. Uh, a, a, a friend of mine um, who now works at the Department of Health and Human Services pointed out that the number of uh, cases of Ebola in the United States were fewer than the number of Republicans running for president when the primary season began. <laughs> Uh, and yet it was, it was front page news here because of, uh, because of a few cases. The real problem of, of, and the epicenter, of course, was in West Africa in three countries. Let me give you an indication of, uh, <coughs> of the importance of health infrastructure in that regard. <coughs> the, um, <coughs> the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, which I have worked on for several years ever since I arrived at the Gates Foundation in the year 2009, um, has a, a, a been funding an emergency operations center in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. And the purpose of that emergency operations center was really uh, to uh, move forward the, the polio eradication program in Nigeria, which is focused in the north. Uh, but it also was able to be used for other uh, uh, health issues. When a, there was a gentleman who, uh, uh, in uh, West Africa who flew to uh, Lagos, Nigeria, he was a Nigerian, and he had Ebola, and he discovered it after he went to the south, I believe to Port Harcourt in Nigeria, and he ended up dying of Ebola. What the Nigerian government did with support from the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, the Gates Foundation, CDC, and others, was to have the deputy of that emergency operations center move to Lagos and set up a new EOC there specifically for the Ebola situation that was arising. And one of the things you have to do in that situation is what they call contact tracing. You need to know who that uh, ill person had been in contact with and, and follow them to see if there are additional cases and re or quarantine people, et cetera. And in the end, they had less than 20 cases in Nigeria. This effort, which was a, an immediate uh, need was met by the creation of this emergency operations center in, in Lagos uh, that was put together very quickly. So that's an example of the importance of having this health infrastructure on the ground because for any of you who've traveled to Nigeria, you realize it's the, it's the most populous country in Africa. It's, um, it has air routes all over the world uh, from out of Lagos and Abuja. And if you'd have had a, a, an explosion of Ebola in, uh, in, the, in Nigeria, uh, you could have had uh, flights to India, flights to Europe, flights to North America, et cetera, and this could have been a disaster, a truly global uh, pandemic. Instead, it was not. Now, that's the good news regarding Nigeria. The bad news is that infrastructure, that emergency operations center uh, that is funded by the Global Polio Program in uh, Abuja is going away. Because when polio is eradicated, as we expect in the coming years, then the program will go away because you won't need it anymore once we finish the job of eradicating polio. Which gets back to the fundamental point that I was saying earlier, how important it is that we invest in these health systems, including these uh, things such as this emergency operations center, including laboratory networks, training networks, surveillance capabilities, uh, and, et cetera, because those are uh, important <coughs> for the global concerns and including U.S. security as well as to the people in the countries themselves that are most affected. Zika is another example. Uh, it doesn't have the same uh, 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 transmission, uh, transmissibility that you find in uh, Ebola, but it's such a tragedy to see uh, uh, these uh, uh, photographs of children who've been born with microcephaly, the smaller heads, uh, and, uh, and Zika is uh, another example of why we need this stronger emergency capacity. After Ebola, uh, the World Health Organization and the international community really w was criticized for its slow response 
And WHO has really uh, undergone a major restructuring of its emergency capacity. Uh, we're, st we're still hoping that, the, uh, that donor governments will fund it. Uh, they did approve a, a major restructuring, but uh, it was to be done out of voluntary contributions, and they're still waiting for s some of those contributions to come in. Um, but it's, uh, it's an element that's uh, very important uh, because we do need that central organization, such as the World Health Organization, to be able to uh, respond uh, as needed when these health emergencies occur. I had spent uh, three years uh, uh, as the special representative on avian and pandemic influenza uh, as my last tour in the Foreign Service before I retired. And uh, one of my frustrations uh, was we were preparing for a potentially catastrophic influenza pandemic along the lines of what happened in 1918, 1919 with what was called the Spanish flu when you may have had uh, 50 or 60 million people around the world die. Um, but, but we weren't really doing uh, as much as I think we should have in terms of strengthening the health system. One of the things that the, the U.S. government in the last few years has pushed is what is called the Global Health Security Agenda. And I'm a real fan of this because it institutionalizes that preparedness for a pandemic influenza, while at the same time recognizing we need to have broad strengthening of health systems uh, in order to res prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease outbreaks. And if you look um, at the CDC website for the Global Health Security Agenda, there are 11 action packages in different areas that they've been working on um, uh, that include pandemic preparedness, but include many other ways in which governments can, pre uh, can be prepared, uh, better prepared all around the world for uh, these uh, potential infectious disease outbreaks. The Global Health Security Agenda was first uh, chaired by the United States government, then by Finland, and now by Indonesia, uh, which uh, I'm very pleased uh, about. And uh, I believe Co South Korea is li likely to take it over next. So it really is working globally, not in every country. It's in about 60 countries. Uh, but it's working closely with WHO to implement what WHO has uh, uh, worked on over the years, which is something called the International Health Regulations. And I'm sure there are a few lawyers in the audience here. Uh, under international law, there are very few things that deal with global health, but this is one of them. The international health regulations have been approved by 196 member states. Uh, and those uh, member states uh, have all agreed to, uh, 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 to build up their capacities so that if there is a public health emergency of international concern, those uh, 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 they will uh, 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 discuss it, they, uh, they will, they will publicize it, they won't keep it secret. Uh, they will uh, build up their capabilities to be able to detect uh, that it's happening earlier than would be the case now if they don't have the sufficient laboratory capacity and trained personnel. It's a whole range of uh, areas that uh, uh, need to be improved in, in countries uh, that uh, don't have full capabilities in terms of uh, uh, prevention and um, detection of diseases. Uh, and. Uh, these international health regulations uh, and the implementation of those are working very closely with the global health security agenda to try to uh, improve uh, the, uh, the, the facilities in, in, in the many countries that uh, have inadequate facilities. There's, and besides that, there's a, a way to try to fund these things, another effort that's out there called the Pandemic Emergency Facility that the World Bank is creating. So there are a lot of areas that have been uh, uh, really built up over the years. Uh, uh, one of the wake-up calls was, as I said, uh, the HIV-AIDS crisis uh, around the turn of the century. Another wake-up call was Ebola back in 2014. I'd say there's a new wake-up call right now, which is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and I'm sure some of you have heard of it. We call it AMR. Uh, <coughs> There's this fear that we're moving to a, a post-antibiotic world, that at some point you won't be able to take antibiotics because they're no longer effective, because they've been overused. And that's a great and very serious fear. Uh, there's, a, there's a fear that uh, uh, more and more deaths will uh, uh, come about because drugs won't be effective. And as a result of this concern, uh, the United Nations uh, on September September 21st held a big high-level meeting, which I had the privilege to attend, 
on the subject of antimicrobial resistance. It was at the head of state level. Uh, you had the Director General of the World Health Organization there, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health, and many others uh, were with these uh, heads of state and heads of government and others to talk about the concerns and to highlight the concerns. And, and, and this is an area that I see the United Nations really being able to make a difference, it, it, to have a global spotlight on this issue. Now, what can you do about it? Well, it's easy to say, let's do more research and development and just create more antibiotics. But as someone pointed out, it takes about 10 years to get approval for, uh, uh, through the entire process of starting research and getting final approval to use a new antibiotic. And once it's in place, then it takes about three years for the resistance to start settling in. So that's one of element of the solution, but it's not the only element of the solution. There are many other ways, but one of the fundamental ones is to reduce dependence and use of uh, uh, antibiotics. And that involves doctors and nurses not, uh, not prescribing antibiotics unless they know that um, the antibiotics are what will solve the problem. It's not just a viral infection. It involves uh, involving veterinarians because sometimes uh, antibiotics are used just for growth purposes, not for health purposes in animal populations, uh, et cetera. It's a, it's a major effort. It's not just for the human health people. It involves uh, many different sectors, including animal health, veterinary, and me veterinary medicine. Um, it includes consumers, the finance ministries, et cetera. But I, trust me, you're going to hear more and more about antimicrobial resistance in the years to come because this is a, a really serious problem. And, uh, there is a plan of action uh, that was approved by the World Health Assembly at WHO in May of last year, but uh, I'm not sure uh, that we're really to the point where there's enough action being taken to really uh, solve this problem. So finally, I'd like to uh, talk about a couple specific uh, uh, areas, uh, or one, one additional specific area. I already talked about the polio, and um, let me just mention one aspect of that, which is the progress that's been made on polio. In uh, 1988, the World Health Assembly uh, uh, vowed that it would eradicate polio. This is all the uh, health ministries from all over the world represented at, the, at WHO in Geneva. Uh, they, it set the goal of uh, eradicating polio. There were 350,000 cases a year at that point of people who were paralyzed for life or sometimes died from the polio uh, virus. Right now, so far this year, there are 27 cases, an amazing drop. But at the same time, it's a very tough slog. We just had a setback in Nigeria. We went almost two years without no, uh, having a case, but now we discovered there were some cases in areas that were controlled by Boko Haram. And the same problems, uh, or similar problems, in Afghanistan and Pakistan in areas controlled by the Taliban. So it's still uh, an effort. Uh, Rotary International, WHO, UNICEF, CDC, and the Gates Foundation are the core partners in this effort, and the UN Foundation works closely with them on this. There's also the measles and rubella initiative, and here's a what I think is kind of a startling fact. In the year 2000, 1,500 people a day died of measles, mostly children. Now the number is 300 per day, an amazing drop because of a major effort to try to uh, eliminate measles. But why should 300 children die every day from measles when it's easily preventable by a vaccine that costs less than a dollar a dose, including delivery? So the way I look on global health is we started in the year, uh, 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 we started when you look back on it, in about the, the end of the uh, last century, start of this century, with this sense of an emergency, especially because of HIV AIDS. There's been a huge explosion, really, in the amount of money that's been put toward global health programs and the number of organizations that are dealing with, with it and the number of people working on it. And yet, there are huge challenges to remain, that remain. We shouldn't have 100 14,900 cases of measles a year as we had in the year 2014. We should be able to finish the job of eradication on polio. We need to strengthen health systems so that we're better prepared to prevent, detect, and respond to health emergencies such as was presented by Ebola. And it's a broad-based effort. The UN agencies are involved, other multilateral organizations, donor governments, 
developing country governments, the, the people themselves in the developing countries, NGOs, foundations, universities. Uh, it's a, it's a broad-based effort, but it's an important one. It's an exciting one. And as I said at the, at the beginning, uh, I see this as a very exciting and consequential time. And while I think you can argue that's the case very broadly for the Sustainable Development Goals, I know it's the case for the area that I tend to focus on, uh, which is global health. It's, it's, uh, it, we've been making a lot of progress. Let's keep it up. Thanks very much. First question, uh, please talk about the interaction between the entities you have been speaking about with groups such as Doctors Without Borders. I think that's a question about how uh, non-governmental organizations and civil society in general are, are part of this ongoing effort. The answer is. <clears throat> yes, uh, there's uh, uh, clearly this effort involves um, uh, NGOs and, and Doctors Without Borders is one of the uh, uh, strong ones. But uh, I assume that part of the question was the criticism that, the, uh, that Joanne Liu, who's the head of Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, made of WHO, because they were on the ground in the Ebola-stricken countries, uh, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, uh, and WHO was not acting quickly enough, and there was uh, some vocal criticism of that. Uh, and I, uh, Margaret Chan, the Director General of WHO, has accepted that criticism, and it's, it's not really just WHO. The international community as a whole was slow. What, um, what they have done, though, as I mentioned, is there have been uh, some uh, 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 basic reforms of the WHO apparatus, including having a new person appointed, Peter Salama, who used to work at UNICEF, as the Deputy Director General equivalent, meaning he's uh, at the same level as the number two person in the organization, to be in charge of emergency response. So there have been these changes, but in the end, um, any of the responses have to be done with governments uh, in the affected countries, with NGOs, with the private sector, and many others. None of these uh, emergencies can just be done by the World Health Organization, and WHO isn't funded to do that. Uh, and, and when you look at the Ebola response, actually, the U.S. military was uh, uh, instrumental in, in providing some of the necessary response uh, because the U.S. military has a certain uh, logistical capacity that uh, WHO will never have. So it's really a, a broad-based effort, and NGOs are critical to that. <clears throat> a member of the audience uh, writes, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Namibia from 2005 to 2007 and did a lot of HIV-AIDS education and prevention work. It was clear that the high rate was directly tied to the inequality of women. Have these health programs you discussed addressed this core problem? There's, a, there's an element of that in the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, but um, in some respects, and this I think you apply a lot of things regarding HIV, um, HIV prevention programs, it, it really uh, is a broader societal issue that's, that's not just a matter of the health program. And so the UN has their UN Women Office, and there's been a strong push in the United Nations for e equality um, for women. And, uh, and in fact, there was a lot of uh, effort uh, in the, the election campaign to have a, a, a woman candidate uh, and a woman be, uh, be elected to be Secretary General. In the end, there were several strong women who were uh, nominated but uh, didn't win the election. But, there, but clearly, th this is an element of it. And, and one of the things that I found in, in, in the country next door to Namibia when I was in uh, Botswana was it really, the prevention efforts really uh, uh, are, are affected by the local culture, the societal norms and standards. It's not the kind of thing where you can just think of, well, here's what sounds good inside the Beltway of Washington or in Geneva or New York or Seattle. You really have to know what the situation is on the ground. And often that takes some very clear efforts uh, uh, to try to change those norms, and, and including um, uh, greater respect uh, uh, for uh, uh, everyone, and particularly women, but uh, it's not always easy to do. And, and so it's a challenge, I would say, for, for the HIV AIDS programs, but it's even a broader challenge for society. Uh, so there's, there's a question having to deal with the training of health personnel as part of the effort to strengthen health systems. Are there programs in Africa that help train MDs, nurses, et cetera, to bolster the infrastructure 
of medical systems, clinics, hospitals, medical schools, nurses' schools. Um, actually, just um, uh, in September, uh, uh, during the, the first big week of the UN General Assembly, uh, President Hollande of France and President Zuma of South Africa released a new report that they had co-chaired on the health workforce and health employment. So there was a, a global look at this uh, situation of the, uh, and, and they had some very specific recommendations coming out of that. But in the end, I have to say there are too many situations where uh, countries that are developed but need, say, nurses will be happy to bring in nurses from the Philippines or from Ghana or wherever and then those countries have fewer nurses as a result, and, and that's one of the problems in terms of uh, the uh, uh, efforts to try to bolster the workforce because sometimes you end up having additional training facilities uh, for people and they end up leaving your country because they've gotten a job elsewhere. Uh, one of the things that I would say is very important in this regard that I, is looked upon not just as an example in Ethiopia, but beyond that, several African nations have gone to Ethiopia to look at the program, is what they have there called the Health Extension Program. Or, or they have over 30,000 health extension workers who are paid nominal amounts and trained in, uh, uh, to some extent to just provide basic health care services in the remote, most remote parts of Ethiopia. And I visited some of those uh, situations and they'll usually have a very simple uh, two or three room uh, health unit. Uh, it may not even have electricity, but it has some of the basics that are needed. Uh, uh, and the people there who are trained are quite proud of their uh, positions. Often they're women, large percentage of these 30 or 33,000 workers are women, that they're able to help provide some, uh, some of the basics of health care uh, in a country that is very poor and, and really needed that. That's a way to uh, expand the, the uh, health program and the health workforce. And, there, and part of it also involves what they call task shifting. When you have what used to be done by doctors, some of that can be done by nurses. What used to be done by nurses, some of that can be done by uh, nurses' aides. Uh, health assistance and others. Uh, you can find some countries where um, doctors are doing, uh, th those with MD degrees are doing what in this country a nurse would do, for example. Uh, we've already kind of fine-tuned that in this country, but uh, in, in some of the uh, countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I'm more familiar, uh, more needs to be done. So there are various efforts to do this, and if you really wanted to look into th the health workforce issues, I would recommend looking at that UN report that was just released that last month. So there are several questions which, uh, which deal with specific diseases, and I'll start with this one. What is the situation in Sudan about the spread of cholera right now? What is the level of the spread, and what is the involvement of the World Health Organization? Yeah, it's a tough one. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I haven't uh, followed closely enough the situation in Sudan uh, uh, with cholera. Uh, I know that WHO is... Um, uh, is working on this and other issues, and, and uh, what we've been following more actually uh, in our office is the situation with cholera in Haiti, because the the UN has asked um, uh, the UN Foundation to help it as it's trying to formulate its program um, for helping victims of cholera in Haiti, um, because but which is kind of complicated as you may know because of. Uh, the uh, uh, assumption that the reason cholera came to Haiti was from United Nations peacekeepers who, who went there. And, um, and yet that there's a question of legal responsibility, et cetera. So we're trying to be helpful to the United Nations in, in that regard. In terms of Sudan, I, I, I'm sorry, I really don't know enough of the specifics on that of what they're doing right now. But uh, it's, a, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's one of those uh, situations where there are so many concerns and uh, cholera, for, for those of us who have access to clean water and sanitation, we're not going to be, con it's not going to be an issue here in this country, but, but uh, it can kill many people. And, and certainly uh, uh, when, when it gets to the emergency stage, we, that's when WHO's new emergency capacity has to be put into place. So a second question about a specific disease, this one about polio, polio eradication. Uh, the question is, is polio, are polio eradication efforts moving from vertical to diagonal? 
Uh, good question. Uh, I think um, one, one of the things that um, you, you're, you, uh, people in the polio world and in other parts of the global health world are, are very concerned about is the, this tr uh, what we call the transition of polio assets. We used to call it the polio's legacy, but now they call it the transition. And the, the, the concern is that when the polio program winds down after the eradication, and Bill Gates was quoted yesterday in the Wall Street Journal as saying that he expects all wild polio virus transmission to, in the world to be stopped by the year 2017, it then takes three years, assuming you have good surveillance capabilities, uh, so that you can detect whether there are any cases anywhere in the world. It takes three years of having no cases anywhere in the world, and then by 2020, uh, polio would be certified as t being eradicated. If that uh, occurs on that schedule, then you're soon after 2020, th this polio program is going to be winding down. And actually, they're already starting it. In January of next year, some of the countries in Africa will have reduced budgets from the polio program. Now, uh, you can argue, well, polio is a vertical program, but they've done studies that show an amazingly large percentage of time of people who work on polio and are funded by the polio program, GPEI as it's called, also do other things for other vaccination programs and routine immunization, etc. So there's already these other benefits. Uh, I work on the measles and rubella initiative in addition to the global polio eradication initiative. Uh, the measles and rubella initiative, which the UN Foundation is a core partner of, um, is very concerned that we're going to lose the laboratory capabilities that the polio program has provided, that we're going to lose the, the ability to put together campaigns, and even though a measles campaign is different from a polio campaign, there are still benefits that we've uh, been able to take advantage of paid for by the polio program. So the question then comes, how does this transition of assets work? And it's just not a simple matter. You don't just, because polio is a billion dollar a year program. Uh, it's, uh, now you can say a billion dollars a year when you had 27 cases so far this year. The thing about it, and this I must say it's a, a bit intoxicating, and I've been working on this, as I said, since 2009, is eradication is forever. Uh, it's the ultimate in equitable and sustainable global health programs. When you eradicate, then no one ever will get polio again in the world. So we're, we're so close, uh, but we still have, have to put this money into it. Well, if you're spending a billion dollars a year even if, the, even if it takes a few years to have that wind down, that's still a big drop. And there's no guarantee that the donors who are giving the money for uh, the polio program are just going to switch to saying, well, let's maintain all these assets. Some of them a country may not need. Some of them were specific to polio uh, uses. Others, the donors may have different priorities. So there's a lot of concern. And in fact, I, I um, uh, hosted a dinner last week in Geneva just to get all the different sides together, just trying to discuss some of this because it's a, it's a very uh, uh, tricky issue to deal with uh, when you're uh, uh, transferring money. I mean, uh, for those of you who followed the U.S. Uh, uh, appropriations process in Congress, it's not like you can just say, well, uh, th it makes sense to use th uh, the money that used to be appropriated for this to put it over there. Uh, and that's simple because th the way Congress works, well, we may drop this, but that doesn't mean we're going to raise this because we have another need over here. Uh, it, it, it's not going to be easy, and uh, other parliaments and Congresses are having similar issues that they're going to have to deal with. So, so picking up on your observation that eradication is forever, there's a question that deals with <clears throat> the refusal of some parents to immunize, have their children immunized because of their uh, fear that immunization causes autism. Uh, the, the audience member asks, how do you convince parents that immunization does not cause autism? I don't, I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that, but maybe you could comment on that general topic. Yeah, I would say look at the science. Uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the, the facts are uh, clear, and, and, and uh, I deal with a lot of the immunization experts at CDC, and there is nobody there who believes that, uh, that these vaccinations cause autism. And in fact, the, um, repo uh, the er, er, studies that were originally um, uh, done that seemed to create that link have since been withdrawn because they were uh, faulty. Uh, the other thing about it is, um, 
uh, I, well, first of all, I come at this from the perspective of somebody who's uh, spent a fair amount of my career living in sub-Saharan Africa. I think it is a crime when you have a child die from a lack of vaccines, as I said, including 300 children a day dying of measles. How can you not want to immunize them? The problem in some respects, I think, is that in this country, we've had such, such success that people don't see the problem. They don't know of people dying of measles, so therefore why should they have their uh, son or daughter uh, vaccinated? Well, if you don't vaccinate your son or daughter, you put others at risk who cannot be vaccinated, such as newborn children who aren't yet of the age to be able to uh, be vaccinated, or people with c compromised immune systems. And it's, it is just simply unfair and uh, I would argue unethical not to vaccinate your children because they may end up getting, uh, contracting this disease and maybe spread it to others uh, who, who aren't as fortunate as you and uh, in, in having a child who uh, can be vaccinated. Uh, it's, um, I, I, I've got quite strong views on this and I know there are some people out there and, uh, 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 in, who feel that, uh, well, but there's this, this link to autism, but there's no scientific basis for it. Yes, well, the trouble is that some people don't, don't believe science, as we know from, from, from the climate topic. So um, anyway, this brings us to the end of our, of our program. And uh, on behalf of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, please give another thank you to Ambassador Lang. And I also thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we also thank today's special sponsors, Midwest One Bank and the Iowa City Noon Rotary Club. Uh, and we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available to the viewing audience. And once again, on behalf of the Iowa United Nations Association, I want to express our gratitude to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council for uh, their, their partnership in this program. And now, Ambassador Lang, as a special token of our appreciation, we present you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. thank you very much. So thank you again for joining us and we are adjourned. <laughs>